It wasn't changing slides for me. Okay. I don't know. Um, you can progress forward by. Um, yeah, I was just using the keyboard. Keyboard. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, place that's close. Yeah. Okay, uh, guys, my name is uh, Kevin Gima, and my first talk is going to be about charge transfer. So, first, I'm going to be uh, talking uh, about the uh, band uh, out vari variable that uh, we're using in our uh, MATLAB scripts. So, uh, basically, uh, the band out uh, variable, it's, a, it's essentially an integration of the partridge files uh, down to uh, one or, or two dimensions. And uh, that, that integration uh, we're using, it is like it essentially uh, a FOIA a, a transform. Uh, so uh, when, when we initially have uh, these uh, partridge files, a lot of uh, a noise is uh, mixed in with the actual uh, da data uh, that, that we need. So uh, to basically uh, cancel out that noise, what we do is we essentially uh, do uh, a Fourier transform uh, just to like uh, take out or reduce the noise and to uh, en enhance the, the data uh, that, that we're using. And then after that, we essentially uh, pl plot our data. So this is the code we use in MATLAB uh, to, to plot everything, and the last two are the waterfall commands that we uh, talked about. Yay. All right. So that's it for the... The sensor is, like, behind you. The yeah. sensor is somewhere under the table. Right behind is like... Under, under the for, take, under, toward the computer. 180 degrees. So right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah somewhere there. there. All right. All right. Uh, so uh, let's uh, finish uh, ta talking about uh, band out. So basically, uh, when, when you plot, you get a graph with a time uh, on the x-axis and then degree of overlap between the two orbitals you're looking at, that goes uh, um, on the, the y-axis. Uh, MATLAB then uh, takes the company files that uh, you make uh, in, in BOSS, and it basically does an uh, auto uh, co correlation. I don't know if, if you guys remember last week, but when D David was presenting his talks on auto correlation on his first slide, uh, there, there was a, an integral equation that he put up there uh, that's essentially like uh, what BOSFIT uh, is doing when it's doing like uh, auto -co correlation, and that equation is essentially a Fourier transform. Not oh. MATLAB script. Oh, Bas MATLAB, MATLAB. Mm -hmm. My mistake. So then, uh, what uh, what essentially is happening? It's a graph that tells you uh, how the correlation between the two orbitals uh, varies uh, in in time. And then uh, right here on the bottom, uh, that's the, the code you, uh, you use uh, to essentially extract whatever uh, data you, uh, you need uh, from the, the band out. So the BH is the, is the variable that represents the electron hole, and the BE is uh, the, the actual electron. Okay, so then um, what, what we have here uh, are uh, more, more graphs. Uh, once again, uh, we're, we're using uh, the, the waterfall command uh, to, to plot everything. The X label is angstrom, which as you guys know, uh, is, uh, is the unit that's used to measure interatomic distances. And then the, the Y axis right here, electron volts, that's the uh, uh, orbital energy. So what this graph is, 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 is essentially telling you is how the orbital energy varies uh, with, with distance. It's distribution of density in space. Okay, distribution of, oh yeah, distribution of density in space. 
what is the connection uh, between the little image on the top, this one, and the rest of the figure? Oh, you mean the uh, this image right here? Yeah. Mm. Is it a visualization of your unaware? Of, the, of your model that you described? Red tail ray? I yeah, yeah, this seems uh, like that like that. And I mean it's and is this the graph here just basically a, essentially a, a slice of that uh, three dimensional uh, graph that we were talking about in David's talk earlier? Um the, the, it's not a trick question, no tricks. Just um, would it would it be right to say that size of the nano wire model on the top and uh, the range on, of the z axis that you show on the, on the bottom mm -hmm. uh, are the same? So uh, yes. the size of your nano wire goes from like minus fifty five angstrom to plus fifty five angstrom. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so it's the same scale, mm -hmm. same length scale. Um, then scientific question, not about uh, uh, protocol. Why the charge density spikes in either left or right? Why it is not homogeneously distributed over the whole nanowire? Uh, why it's, it spikes over uh, certain uh, parts uh, of the yes. nanowire? Yes. Um, Okay, I'm taking a guess here, but did the spot where these spikes happen, are these essentially the, I'm guessing these are the parts of the near wire where it's doped? Yes, excellent, perfect, great answer. Can you point where are the dopings uh, on the image? All right, so it's, the doping is essentially this color, the things right here, this is a doping here, this is a doping here, this is a doping here, and right here. So uh, blue is sodium and purple is iodine. All right. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And um, you know, you have the same thing uh, right here uh, for for the the these two graphs. These are just basically uh, different orbitals. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Let's. Um, is there what is the <clears throat> connection between left and right parts of uh, of your slide? Um. So the like um. Where is this orbital, which is like the uh, Luma on the right side of the display? So this uh, corresponds to uh, this uh, part right here. Okay, and the Homo, or Homo minus one, where is on it? Uh, right here. Excellent, thank you. Okay, uh, so then uh, next we're talking about the media and structure of the PPE and the PPH uh, variables. Uh, PPH is the population of the electron tron hole, and then uh, PPP is the population of the uh, e electron uh, orbital, orbital. Just to uh, clear, clear that up. So then, uh, the population of the uh, electron orbital, uh, it's actually uh, an array, uh, which is essentially a one-dimensional uh, matrix, and it has uh, two indices. Uh, one index so is... Matrix? Not one dimension, two dimension. Okay. So then, yeah, the array has uh, two indices. One index is a time step, the, the other index is the, the number of orbitals, and uh, we're counting from the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital end up. And um, this array uh, has the population uh, of orbitals, and we're, we're looking at the population of orbitals as they're uh, changing, changing in time. Uh, the, the PPH array is similar to, to this one, uh, right here, except this is the population of the actual electron hole. Uh, li like this, PPH has like two indices, 
the first index is the time step like this right here. The other index um, is the number of, of orbitals. And this time we're counting from the highest occupied molecular orbital and, and down. And then the data values in, in each record of this array, uh, they're corresponding to the non-equilibrium population of the originally occupied orbitals. Okay, and then um, this is this is just just a code uh, we're we're using to make the graph for PPE and PPH uh, waterfall PPE. We're basically graphing the population of electron orbitals. Waterfall PPH. We're graphing the population of the whole whole over whole orbitals. And the bottom three lines of code right here is what we're, we're is all this. We're essentially merging the populations of the electrons and holes into uh, one variable. Uh, okay, and then all all three of these uh, graphs uh, right here is the population of the uh, electron orbitals. This is the the code we're using in MATLAB to make these graphs waterfall as we've like discussed countless times is the actual uh, command we're using to make this, um, where this axis and the numbers were uh, specifying the range that this axis is displaying on in the lab. And then the X label, uh, we're calling it uh, time steps, as you can see on all three of these graphs. And then this graph is right here as an example. Uh, this graph right here is the population uh, of the, the whole orbitals waterfall PPH, and as David discussed in his previous talk, the axis is right here is the time steps, uh, Y axis is the specific orbital we're looking at, and then the Z axis right here um, is the actual population of the, the orbital it, itself. Uh, same thing for, for this graph, except for this graph, we're looking at the whole orbitals, and the uh, graphs are essentially uh, the same. The x-axis, y-axis, z-axis are essentially the same. What's the difference between the top and bottom on the right? They're both for the holes, but something is different. Okay. Uh, I think these are the, the same graphs, but uh, the, the y-axis, um, there's a, less of a range here that, than it is here. So here, the y-axis is kind of like uh, smushed together. There's a, a greater range here on the y-axis. And here, as far as the y-axis goes, we're zooming in a little bit. And uh, how does um, the index of most populated orbital changes in the top and bottom? So in the top, you originally have uh, number six is uh, has population one. And at the end, uh, orbital number one has largest population, right? What is on the bottom? Uh, so, okay. Uh, so the the bottom is essentially uh, the the same thing is happening uh, for for the these orbitals. Is the same uh, is zero, and then it climbs back up to to one. And then we see the same thing happening on uh, the, this this graph right here. So counting of orbitals in the in a different direction, right? Mm -hmm. So what what David has introduced uh, the uh, p p h the largest number corresponds to orbital deeper in the valence band. But if we try to go to computation of observables, it can make uh, Confusion. If you want to overlay it with energies, because uh, it should be like a lower index if we are deeper, and then continuously increasing as we, as we go through all orbitals. So in the this lower panel, this HPP orbital, the running of index is uh, alternated in the opposite direction to match uh, natural count of the orbitals. Can we that in the other one? Huh? Is that like that in the other ones? It is the same data, but they are presented in a different way. Like um, <clears throat> the, uh, 
fui com uma ilustração. Isso. Uh, 96 here. Then we go down into the index. We go to the home minus uh, 4. And here, this uh, home minus 4, we, we actually go up. It will be 97. So the, the counting of uh, index of orbitals goes in the opposite direction. You can, you can label x as i or homo minus i. Oh, yeah. just, just, just mirror reflection. I, that's what I figured it was because it looks like the hole is gaining energy. It goes from top of the valence band down to something. It, it's just um, mirroring of the in, index sound. Okay, uh, the next uh, we have here is more graphs. So like the, the previous graph, water fall PPE is the population of the electron orbitals. PPH is the population uh, of the whole, whole orbitals. And like the uh, same thing in the last slide, we're merging um, all of this together into uh, one um, uh, array. And then um, the, uh, this uh, gra uh, graph right here, x-axis is the time, uh, time steps, here is the orbital uh, index, so this is essentially a, a slice of that three-dimensional graph we saw uh, in, in the uh, previous slide. Okay, and then uh, this li line of code here, we have density uh, distribution as uh, a, a function of, of space. So uh, this is all uh, the, the MATLAB code uh, we're, we're using uh, to, uh, to, to make these graphs. Uh, this is a similar graph to the graph we had two slides ago. X-axis right here is the time uh, steps. Uh, and then um, a little bit of a difference here. Uh, this axis is, is the ang angstrom, so then it, inter-atomic uh, distance. And then uh, this graph is just uh, t telling us uh, how, how the energy uh, changes uh, with, with both uh, distance and, and time. And as you can see, uh, these uh, spikes right here, uh, they correspond to the doping. So these colored uh, things you see here, that's where the near wires were doped. And these energy spikes correspond to where the near wire was doped. Uh, same thing uh, for for uh, this nano wire right here. Okay, um, this is a, a slightly different graph. This is a one dimensional one dimensional density distribution as to as a function of space, and then a one. Uh, dimensional density distribution as a function of uh, space, uh, space and time. So y-axis is uh, is distance in, in angstroms, and uh, x-axis uh, it, uh, it is the time. And then uh, this is just uh, showing once again how the the energy uh, is changing with uh, di distance as in time. And, and once again, not, um, not, uh, not energy, position or spatial localization, right? So then uh, this is telling us how uh, distance is uh, changing with uh, time. Uh, okay. Most probable localization of electron changes in time. Okay. Yeah, most probable localization of electron changes, how that's changing in time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that's what this graph is showing. Uh, once again, uh, these colors are, are the doping. And then this is just some additional code right here. This is the expectation value of uh, position of excited uh, electron 
pull. Uh, where uh, we're basically like putting all that data into these uh, variables uh, right here. And then this last three lines of, of code here is we're plotting everything. And then you get th this graph to your left. All right, the next thing I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, the dipole variable. So the dipole variable is a, an array or a vector with just a one, one index. With, and then this index refers to the, the number of that specific or, orbital which it's uh, talk, talking about. The data of record number i in the dipole array, that's basically the expectation value of the z coordinate for the, the number i. So then um, uh, the, this dipole, um, that as you can see here, this is basic, basic drag notation for those of you who've taken quantum uh, mechanics. So this is the expectation value uh, for the dipole, which I'm sure you guys have seen um, count, uh, countless times. And then um, this uh, INT DZ integrating with re respect to uh, DZ, the probability uh, density squared uh, times the, the position Z. So that's like that's basically this dipole is essentially the expectation value of z in the i orbital. Uh, yes. So, you say that the dipole is a it's a one D vector. Is each element of that vector just the dipole moment for a different um, different i? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, z, you... z, z projection of a dipole moment because we are interested in uh, voltage and current only in, in z direction. And are you taking into account off diagonal stuff or just I, I in that graph notation? Just, uh, just. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, this, this line of code is the expectation value of, of the position of the excited electron volt, uh, excited electron or hole. This is the MATLAB code you'd use to find the expectation value. And then this is the expectation value of the, the dipole. Okay, next uh, I'm going to talk about the ABEDIP variable. Uh, it's a, an array with each index indicating the, the time step. Uh, it contains the value of the electric step dipole at each uh, point in, in time. Each value of the dipole array is multiplied by an the appropriate value of the PPE or PPH array at each uh, point in time. So then the partial contribution of each orbital uh, to the formation of the dipole at each point in time. And then all partial contributions of each orbital are basically uh, summed together. And then they provide a value of the ABE DIP array and then the, this is just uh, the sum of the dipole at the, at the highest uh, occupied molecular orbital plus uh, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And then um, this is the MATLAB uh, code you would use to uh, get uh, first the excitation value of the dipole. That's what these first two lines are. And then this is the dimensionless dipole time interview increment, and then the time integration, and then this last, the line here is the rate of the dipole change. So it's the same thing as David was introducing for hot uh, uh, rotation energy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, here we're, we're plotting the, the posi position with uh, respect to time, red is the position of the electron, uh, green is the uh, position of the hole, and then blue is the position of the dipole. Uh, I th something I think is worth pointing out is that the red graph is essentially uh, the inverse of, uh, of the green graph, which is uh, to be expected because red is the position of the electron and green is the position of a hole, hole being the absence uh, of electron so it makes sense that these two graphs are essentially like uh, uh, an inverse of, uh, of each other. They are essentially like mirror images 
of e each other around the... Uh, huh? Here, it, it, it could be a coincidence. It is not a general theorem. Okay. Um, electron and hole could very likely be at the same uh, place. All right. Uh, as, as you have seen in the talks by London. Okay. So it, uh, they do not they do not need to be mirror reflection. Okay. It's maybe there your system is symmetrically doped and there is some uh, symmetry, but it is not general. Okay. Oh, can you can you go back this one? Yes. No. 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 The yeah. Okay, uh, la last uh, slide here. Uh, this is basically a graph of uh, of a dipole and uh, how how it's uh, changing the time. Um, this solid line here, uh, we're basically uh, this is essentially like uh, fit fitting it. Um, that's basically like a rough rough fitting, and then um, this is the the MATLAB code we use to to generate. Uh, uh, this graph. So the, the goal is to make some tricks for these two lines to coincide. Okay. Find such fitting that would uh, the solid line will literally follow the dashed line, right? All right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, here, this is uh, essentially like all the MATLAB code I've talked about in this in this talk. Uh, I've uh, condensed it into just uh, one page, so if you guys want to, you can just download the, uh, the this PowerPoint and go to the slide and just copy uh, paste uh, each uh, of the MATLAB code into your MATLAB script. And that's essentially my first talk. Any questions? Okay, let's thank Kevin. Okay, we, we had some discussion. Let's go to the... Uh, to the next one. So those of us who uh, are working on charge transfer or may eventually uh, move towards charge transfer uh, aspects uh, may need to do the same things as this first talk. And the second talk would be uh, basic concepts because uh, we are switching gears and move from observables that deal with uh, charge migration uh, in space towards ability of system to emit light. And uh, it's, uh, there are some challenges in computing that, and uh, before we go into the details, uh, I can you provide some background. All right, uh, so uh, this is, I'm basically talking about the theoretical concepts behind uh, photo uh, illuminescence. So don't worry for those of you guys who think that my, the previous talk was really long. This is going to be uh, much shorter. So uh, what is it? Photo, photoluminescence is basically a light emission by matter after absorbing photons. Uh, so so you basically have our classic uh, electron uh, uh, model uh, and an electron can, can jump up or down in energy. An electron when it uh, absorbs photons, which is basically like uh, light particles, uh, it can jump uh, one, one or two energy levels, and then when it does that, it emits light. So that, in a nutshell, is what photoluminescence is. And then for fluorescence is the rapid emission of photons uh, as electrons when they jump from an excited state uh, to, to a ground level. So this is just the inverse uh, uh, of that, so when electrons drop to a lower energy level, they give off photons. That's what fluorescence is. And then, shoot, I don't know how to say this. Phosphorescence. Um, it's the it's a delayed uh, emission of photons um, that have been trapped in a so-called forbidden state. And then um, Einstein coefficients. Um, they're basically a measure of the probability of absorption or emission of, of light uh, by matter, spontaneous emission, on this electron spontaneously decays from high to a low energy level, <coughs> simulated or induced emission, 
uh, electron drifts from a higher energy level to a lower one uh, with uh, electromagnetic radiation. And then absorption, uh, a photon is absorbed by the atom, causing an electron to jump from a lower energy level to a higher one. And then um, these are the, the Einstein uh, coefficients. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, this is this is the the emission uh, co coefficients and uh, uh, absorption uh, co coefficients. Uh, yeah, yeah, B B one two and B two one, uh, which is these guys. They're the outside coefficients for photon uh, uh, absorption and a. A21, that's the Einstein coefficient for uh, spontaneous uh, uh, emission. So these are these are the equations for the absorption and emission coefficients. Um, that's what happened. All right. Uh, yeah. So uh, since these images aren't displaying, I have to go to that. We uh, all you know, have the printouts, so you can just. Uh, okay, I'll copy it. Okay. Uh, okay. So. So yeah, I saw Stein coefficients. Um, you you saw that on the previous slide, and then. Um, the transition dipole moments is that okay? All right, I'm not gonna like focus on, on that anymore. Just follow along uh, with, with this. Uh, the transition uh, di dipole uh, uh, moments um, um, that uh, you're using uh, psi b and uh, and psi a, uh, which is the wave function for uh, those appropriate. Uh, um, ener energy levels, and you're measuring the probability of uh, tra transition by taking the, uh, that integral. That's what it, is, it essentially is. And then in the last slide, uh, we have our equation for um, uh, oscill oscillator strength. And then uh, that's essentially my talk. Are there any questions? Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, the equation for oscillator strength, strength is the delta function of E2 minus E1? Uh, or is it just e, E2 minus E1? It's just E2 minus uh, E1. There's a no. Uh, it's not delta. an energy conserving delta function? Uh, no. Then the bigger the in energy, the it's a, it, it, it is not spectral. It's one number of so strengths for um, specific pair of uh, initial and final. So the larger the difference, the higher the difference in energy. The What's R? Some alpha. And what's one and like X, Y, and Z? Three projections? R. Well, what's R? Coordinate. R. R. X. R. One. Well, for the vector R, there are three components X, Y, and Z. R sub X. What's the M1 and M2? M1 and M2. One M1 and two M2. Probably some quantum uh, numbers for initial and, and final state. It looks like it is uh, borrowed directly from Wikipedia with the link provided at the bottom of the page. Oh, but it's 
something surprises you? Yeah, this is the, the, the large. The larger the difference in the end, the higher the less in the end. The might change though. Like if you increase the energy of your orbitals. Because if you increase the transition energy, your orbitals will change shape as well. Okay. So with that transition dipole moment, it might counteract. That linear. Okay, so it also. Because the farther they are apart, this R is measures how far they are apart, right? Is the expectation value, not expectation, matrix element of position group. Yeah. So if uh, if we transition between orbitals is associated with oscillation of charge, this state will be able to absorb it. If initial and final uh, uh, do not induce uh, oscillation of charge, it will not absorb it. So it's uh, Hamiltonian of interaction between the light in its lowest uh, order is charge is dipole of the uh, matter times electric field. And dipole is charge times position. Mm -hmm. So if you are uh, processing the matrix element of the interaction between light and matter, it will bring you to the matrix element of the position of the room. Okay, I see. Good. More questions to the speaker? If not, I'll thank you once again. Thank you. And, uh, Next uh, speaker is Dr. Yul Khan. So we will go from uh, theory uh, fundamentals to the practical aspects of how to uh, compute the ability of system, how to quantitatively uh, assess the ability of system to uh, emit light based on available electrodynamics data and how to predict uh, not only ability but uh, quantitatively assess at which frequency, with uh, which efficiency and things uh, like that. Yeah, so here are some necessary files for the PL computation. The, the printout is a, a little obsolete. Uh, the the um, actual drop, drop is more low. Mm -hmm. so, MATLAB code, this is the name of the MATLAB code, and this is the message in the symbolism. Also, we need a four master EQ. This is also the stress in the matrix one, right? So, that is how to uh, get this four master EQ now. So, basically, we use this, this command. This is on the formaster EQ file line. So this is uh, also the stress in the matrix format. And we can see the diagonal is zero, and all other values are not zero. So in some sense, uh, then, so diagonal is zero because E1 minus E2 will be zero. So the solid strength of the, uh, from orbital to itself will be zero. Make sense? And also, there is one thing you need to pay attention. So, in the coupling calculations, you need an input overlap file. And for the formaster EQ calculations, you also need this input overlap. You need to make sure you are using the same uh, input overlap. So, yes, it's just to. Just put these files into a central area and it all is 
And uh, where do you set up the uh, window of orbitals? Because in, in, uh, any time uh, one starts using this uh, code, one needs to uh, manually modify. So here, we need to tell the starting point and end point of the outputs. We need an X. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So here is a, an example. This is a time resolved mission. This is a time integrated mission. So the guess is similar to the method we calculated the configure. But we just use different equations. Like here we multiply the oxidant stress. So what what is the um, definition of the inverse population? And how does it relate to uh, what we do here in this operations. Here? Yes. Like which pair or pairs of orbitals are able to emit and which are not able to So suppose at a at a specific time the orbital occupation is normal plus 10, then we consider all transitions from normal plus 10 to orbitals below. Like we can consider normal plus 10 to normal plus 9, transition from normal plus 10 to normal. So um, is there any relation between this concept of inverse occupation and uh, Fermi distribution. Like, um, materials which are in thermal equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium, uh, their electronic occupations follow uh, Fermi distribution, and they can contribute like black, to black body radiation at certain times. But it will be different from uh, this uh, photo luminescence. So the inverse population is uh, is what we create when we populate our transit poles. It means we uh, bring systems very far away from thermal uh, distribution. So uh, in um, thermal distribution, the occupation of uh, states decrease as we go from lower to higher all, all the time, monotonically. And as uh, soon as we make a spike, if we do some something which has higher energy but bigger population, it uh, has a chance to be highly missing. Okay. Here is our excite on uh, image. So it's just another expression, I guess, for the grid figure. So in the grid figure, we have electron also can hold this, right? They are treated separately. And here, we just calculate the difference. So it's like electron also minus hope. And we can have this kind of part. And it, it is not actually exciting. No. So there is no electron pole interaction. It's uh, just pair, a collection of pairs of uh, independent orbitals, but they are presented in the same format as one would represent excitons. 
what's, what's the definition of this row? Okay. Some density? Yeah, uh, occupation, I, occupation. Then you know the density. Okay. Just distribution of uh, if you remove this uh, densities, rho i and rho j j. Then it will be density of excited states. It's same, same, same as related uh, electron pole. No, 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 no. Wait. Uh, um, when you what absorption yeah. in your words, yeah. right? Then you can artificially set uh, oscillator strengths equal to uh, one for any pairs, and then it will be density of excited states. Or uh, the pairs, yes, yes, pairs. Yes, yes. This pairs. So it will be same format as absorption spectrum, but if you all transitions will be uh, visible. While in the absorption spectrum, some of them will be multiplied by zero and not visible. Yeah, right. And here it is the same thing, but this uh, product of uh, uh, rows parses only those elementary pairs of uh, electron code that are being occupied at a given point of time. Right? So it shows uh, how excitation energy distribution evolves in time. Make sense? For ex ex well, uh, when needs to add elton uh, Coulomb interaction, you can add the uh, whole exclusive to, to account. So it is the same format, but uh, um, if you set up Coulomb interaction between Elton and Paul artificially equal to zero and run your code, you will get the same thing. Question. So the interactions here are coming from the heat band? Right. From the thermal, thermal cascading. Cooling for the hot electronic hot hole. Dissipating electronic energy into various vibrations. Same thing with the class. Huh? Same thing we did in class. Mm -hmm. More questions? Especially from David. Nothing uh, too much challenging. Do you think you'll be able to repeat it within a week? I hope so. Okay. And if not, I know where to find him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Then uh, please join me in thanking you. Summarize um, how to convert data on uh, photoluminescence for a system that is being uh, exported with a code into quantitative measures of photoluminescence efficiency. So she will uh, cover the ways to compute quantum yield of photoluminescence and <clears throat> in some sense he will um, establish connection between uh, presentation 
of Yun in presentation, a second presentation of Kevin. So if you returning how to bring back uh, results of uh, simulations to the uh, shoulders of giants. So, yeah, just kind of rehashing some of the observables we talked about before, ready to recombination. And then some uh, non ready to how to get your photoluminescence in. Some exploratory ideas for computing transient absorption for the excited state. And so, everything, the most competitive aspects of our research is towards excited states. So, you get an excited state somehow. So, imagine this is an atom. You photo excited, you get an atom at a non equilibrium spot. It's going to want to get back to equilibrium eventually. And there are multiple pathways to do that. So, it could emit light to get back down to E1, or it could emit heat if it was in a crystal to get back to equilibrium, or it could also just transfer to something else too if it was coupled. And so, if you start with this picture, what are the ways that it can recombine? So, the first person to kind of think about this was Einstein. He was probably just doing his usual thing, sitting around smoking his pipe and just debating with people all day long and, and thinking about thermodynamics a lot. But he eventually used some a bunch of thermodynamic arguments to get to this expression. So our radiative rates is, we say it's equal to the Einstein coefficient. So this is the A that was in Kevin's presentation. And for specifically for luminescence, it usually comes from the HOMO-LUMO gap. So I just specify HOMO-LUMO for the indices. And then Chabuds basically turns out to be a bunch of constants, except for your transition energy. Uh, the generosity of your states, and then he left it that uh, this one term where it's the probability of transition. And at the time, like people didn't really know what this probability of transition was, they just called it oscillator strength. And the next slide will go over how that was figured out. But essentially, for everything we compute with our oscillator scripts, you can get your transition energy from the transition energy and the oscillator strength from the OS strength file that we generate. So those, so if you get those two observables, you can in principle just calculate this rate if you just get a spreadsheet, plug in all the other numerical values in. So uh, oscillator strength, if it is a favorable uh, emission, is of the order of one. Or if you normalize it, yes. And what is the order of magnitude for the rest of the factor? Oh. If, if it is like um, yellow light to electron volt transition, is there like rough number? Is it like 1,000, um, 10, 10 minus third? So generally, your radiative rates for systems that we deal with a lot will be on the order of inverse nanoseconds or but beyond the time scale of nanoseconds, so yeah, inverse nanoseconds. So if you're measuring in uh, nanoseconds, then uh, oscillator strength is about one, and all other factors are 10 to the minus nine. Or if you are in nanoseconds, then uh, uh, the order of one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I guess. Good. Yeah. And also here, we need to consider the degeneracy of the states. Yes. So. If for some reason your LUMO, like if you had, if you think about this picture here, so if you had two states only going to one, it's, you're kind of competing with another state, so you have a factor of a half less probability of that transition occurring. And if it is both, it goes from one to two? Yes, yeah, you have more options, so it's more likely to happen. Mm. But most of our, most of the things we calculate, this term just evens out for it's a wash. It's usually two over, for, well, the stuff I deal with, it's two over two. Two lowest energy and two blue most states. And so the next slide is really informative, but it kind of describes where the oscillator strength term comes from. So this guy is Paul Dirac. And he was one of the first people to try to mix 
electromagnetic waves with quantum states. And then he did, you might have gone over in class time-dependent perturbation theory, but if you take the quantum classes, you'll see a little bit of it, but eventually he figured out that that strange probability term in Einstein's equation just came out to uh, this term, which is essentially a Fermi Golden Rule rate, which he actually discovered, but he named it after Fermi because he's modest or something. But then, yeah, he figured out that the probability of the optical transition is, comes from the transition dipole operator. Oh, and this uh, first equation denominator nu sub h o minus l u is it the same uh, term. E2 minus E1 that uh, Dan was asking about. Yeah, it's essentially transition energy. Should we use some new way of fuel with frequency? Yeah, so it's frequency. So if you, if you play with the H bar terms, you can just turn it into straight energy. If you multiply and divide it by H bar, yeah. then you, you get the transition energy and energy. And then H bar squared in the Okay, here it should be some and some energy conserving delta. So this is just one possible transition. So it's the assume that you have resonance uh, set up. So you have atom uh, with a transition frequency, given transition frequency, and given line that is exactly you. Oh, this is not real. Right, yeah, this is this is just a probability. So this is not very cold. Um, well, a fairly golden rule will be like cross section or absorption rate. And, and here is uh, simplified to to resonance condition. So it's just dimensions. Yes. And so that covers just the brief background on rate of recombination. And so the other possible ways if you have like an electron in a crystal, which is like a solid state, which is like pretty much all of us are dealing with for our research. It's, uh, they can exchange energy with each other. So if you have an electron that's not in equilibrium, it can emit a phonon to get back down to equilibrium. And this picture is a guy named John Tully. He, didn't, he wasn't the first person to discover non-radiative recombination or non-adiabatic couplings necessarily, but he was just the first to try to implement it into molecular dynamics. And basically, he was the first person to do like all the simulations that we did, but in a different form. And so, yeah, what describes that exchanging of energy is essentially the non adiabatic coupling term that we've seen a lot in meetings. And so, practically, so when we do, so when we convert the non adiabatic couplings into the Redfield tensor, you can just look into the Redfield tensor for the specific homo lumo transition you want, and that will just give you the rates of the non radiative recombination, or an approximation of it anyway. So for my system, the homo lumo gap was corresponding to these states, which you can find from your energy pop. So you go to energy pop, it'll tell you which, uh, where in the matrix these states will be. So if you do R, 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 and then those states, so it'll spit out a number at you. And this number will be in inverse femtoseconds. Just so when you're trying to convert it into uh, something that makes sense with your radius. So, so how far uh, this, how much this number will change if uh, instead of 51 and 52, one would put like 52 and 53? Um, Which will be like uh, woman who was one. Right. Well, this system will be about the same as a degeneracy. But if you go, if you just look at, okay, fifty-two right. and fifty-four. And so, you can, you can uh, finger uh, right on the screen. I think. I 
go to the next slide? Yes, please. Oh, there we go. And so, so the 51 52 transition is like the across the band gap. Mm -hmm. Dimitri was asking if you looked at states in the conduction band, like how do these rates compared to this number. Mm -hmm. And something like this would be, um, I don't know, probably like at least three orders of magnitude. So it'd be more on like e to the minus o three order of magnitude in inverse sample So 10 to the minus third right. inverse sample seconds. Right, so it's a lot quicker, maybe a lot quicker. So uh, this, um, the number on, on the bottom, eight times 10 to the minus seven is about one times 10 to the minus six inverse of the seconds, which will be about one, one inverse uh, minus seven. Right. Mm -hmm. And the uh, transitions inside the band will be about one inverse picoseven. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. And so, and so for when, when we make our figures, one way to keep all of them kind of internally consistent would be to use, to choose the, the length or the non-radiative recombination time as the uh, time scale for the dynamics that we do. And so this is just taking the, so K is a rate, so if you do the inverse, it gives you a time. Mm -hmm. And then you just stick in the number that I got from the Redfield tensor. That gives you about one nanosecond for a time. So when you're making your blue, your blue figures at least, you want to have the time axis go to about roughly the same time as here. And for this figure, one nanosecond would be about three on our blue figure plug scale because it's kind of hidden in the background. But. So just log a one nanosecond over one picosecond gives you three. So that's how I arrived at that three number there. And so that way you can, it makes sense. So if you had like a comparison model that you were doing, it would make sense to compare like the, the integrated PL between models. Because otherwise you could just run it for an arbitrary time and it's kind of hard to make comparisons between models. You're trying to look at their emission capabilities anyway. And then, and then to compute the actual photoluminescence quantum yield. So basically it's just the ratio of the rates of your rate of recombination divided by the sum of all the competing mechanisms. And so for generally for simulations, we only worry about Radiative and non-radiative rates, but in principle, it could be your model could be interacting with something else where the charge could transfer. So you'd also have to consider that as well. Aaron, mm -hmm. uh, how would you modify this equation if you are looking for uh, photoluminescence not from the terminal, not from Homo Lumo, but from highly excited state? If it will be, how do you assess uh, for the of photoluminescence from uh, Let's say homo to homo plus forty. Right. You have to, to account for the rates of all the possible transitions, and so. So in case I don't know all the permutations, but you would, it would be the rate of whatever transition Dimitri was talking about plus all the other hundreds of transitions. So the the uh, rates of non-radiative cooling. 
right now your K and R stands for uh, recombination mm -hmm. because it's only one channel on the when we are on the lowest excitation hole. Mm -hmm. And if you excite it higher up, one needs uh, to add in the denominator rates for cooling from whatever room of plus 40 to room of and any intermediate states. Mm -hmm. And it will automatically make this quantum yield much smaller. Yes. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, hot luminescence usually doesn't have a good yield or even big signal. So, mm -hmm. so suppose my condition is from normal plus three to homo, then how many terms should I include it for the KNR? From Lumo plus three to from homo? Homo, from Lumo plus three to homo. To homo. So then, it would be Luma plus 3 to Homo, Luma plus 3 to Luma plus 1, plus 2. And then, if you're just only looking for the efficiency of that one transition, I think that would be it. Yeah. So it would be 4 terms, or 5. Okay. And then, well, I guess the maximum quantum yield you can have is one, generally. Well, for the systems we look at, anyway. If you're just thinking of radiative and non-radiative, the combinations is generally one. So you can have a range of values from one all the way down to, well, I guess, in principle, zero. But numerically, you never see zero. So typical values you can see are I've gotten some for models that are about 10 to the negative 8 to 10 to the minus 4. And those are kind of unusual systems. But if you're just looking for luminescence across the band gap, I've seen, for my models anyway, getting 50% quantum yields, which is pretty reasonable considering the, the size of the model that we deal with. But if it will be like a couple of percent, like around 1%, it will still be uh, something that one would be able to detect experimentally. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, and then, so yeah, this is something new that Dimitri and I have been kind of talking about. So if you're not familiar with transient absorption, it's basically a way to pump probe experiments is another term that people call it. So basically you create an excited state and then you do laser pulses to track absorption signatures of the excited states as they cool to the band edges. So basically you can get an idea about the kinetics of the excited states. So it's kind of what we would base a lot of our, from our simulation, it's a natural comparison test. To, compare with people who do transient absorption. So yeah, information you can get is population dynamics, rates of population change, and long lived intermediates. And from our from the calculations we do, we see all these things too. So it's if you can find a good experimentalist who does transient absorption, it's be good for your career. Get some papers out of it. So but with slight modifications to our code, specifically in the Time resolved emission. You should basically, if you just disallow downward transitions, you look for upward transitions between the electron and the hole. So uh, swap the direction of the carrot. Instead of j bigger than i, make j smaller than i. Right. Right. And then you keep your oscillator strength the same. Keep energy conserving terms the same. And then the population term the same thing. So it's basically just playing with code a little bit. So getting a reasonable figure or something that makes sense. And yeah, that's a work in progress. I can't even say that. I haven't really started working on it yet, but it's in the future plans. <laughs> okay. So those three minutes have some meaning? No. Just to, just to differentiate the Parenthesis. So you just so it's, it's not anti-commutator. It's, it's not anti-commutator. No. 
So it's just difference? Yes, difference. just difference. Because if you have a fractional occupation, you would have half the spectro signature. If your initial, if your source and target states both are 50% occupied, then it is not able neither to emit nor to absorb. Saying like if both are unoccupied, it cannot neither emit nor absorb. And if both are occupied, 100%, neither emit nor absorb. But they're well, okay, but they're if they're 100%. Hmm? They're both quite 100%. I agree. If um, I want to emit my mass to your seat while you are sitting there. You will not allow me to do it because it is already occupied. Okay, let's uh, please join me. Thank you, Aaron. Are there are more questions. Okay. I think we had enough discussion. There is a very important uh, presentation by Dr. Fatima. So, how all these uh, um, approaches for computing photo lessons would um, be modified if one needs to exclusively treat the dispersion of a model for uh, peer recording systems? And then to talk about how to calculate a momentum result of luminescence and how to make a movie uh, for two dimensional density distributions of the electron and how. In order to calculate uh, photoluminescence, uh, we need four five, five files uh, red print super tensor, energy clock files, which consists of all the orbitals in consider times the total number of total number of orbitals for all k points. And format the reference file, brand out, and uh, the method was kept. So this is the MATLAB course for calculating the field uh, super tensor. Uh, after successfully running this code, uh, we should have this file R. Red field super tensor which uh, consists all of the 16 red field tensors for same key points and different key points. And one more file energy pop is considered so all of the considered orbitals if they are not uh, In this slide, you can see how the cornerstone optics are a matrix. Is arranged. As you can see, the Formoster optic files for all considered 4K points are along the diagonal of this metric, and Formoster dot one means Formoster optics uh, file for K point one. So you are implementing conservation of momentum. For mm -hmm. optical transitions do not change momentum of a particle. Mm -hmm. And that's how this Formoster optics uh, file for K point one is arranged. And all these zeros are not a single matrix element. Each of them is a matrix, which has dimensions, same as dimension of this former star of the Each of these zero is a matrix, which has dimensions just like this one. Or this one. So suppose if the dimension of this one is 200 to 200, this zero is a matrix which has dimensions uh, 200 
and all of the elements are zero. Uh, next, uh, so one needs to edit this uh, initial states here, and as input files, we should have energy power files which consists all of the total considered orbitals. This momentum, how to calculate this momentum? I'll talk later on. And uh, one should edit these values here: uh, homo, lumo. Uh, Minimum number of states and maximum number of states. After successfully running this photo uh, yes, sense matrix course, one should have this dynamics figure. Electron dynamics figure is X dynamics of excitation figure. This time is all the uh, emission. This time integrated emission. And this last one, I just plotted time integration emission as a function from zero to zero. And this blue dashed line, it is for absorbance of absorption. I just wanted to compare this to equation and absorption. Now I'm going to talk how to make a movie for two dimensional density distributions of energy, momenta, uh, and time. So basically, this, uh, this part of MATLAB uh, codes are taken from MATLAB code for red field tensor for calculating red field super tensor. So here we can see we need to uh, combine all of the energy of files to a single uh, file uh, consisting two indices, J, which is the total number of orbitals we consider for all K points, and K is the total number of K points here. After running this part of MATLAB codes, uh, we have energy of files with two indices, this J and K. Then uh, we introduced a super index, big J, which consists previously introduced two indices, uh, small J and small K. And after su successfully, after running successfully this part of MATLAB course, uh, we will have this energy profile which will consist all the um, orbitals for all k-points and this momentum with a uh, uh, newly introduced index is big J and as you can see this momentum will consist only the values of k-points uh, now actually this part uh, of MATLAB script is taken from the electron dynamics figure so and then uh, this part uh, Consider the codes how to and uh, two slides after these slides also consider the matrix codes for uh, calculating electron um, movie. And uh, this matrix code is actually included to this uh, uh, electron dynamics uh, calculation for matrix code. So, uh, so if you edit all of these. Uh, uh, so what is spike E and spike P? This E, mm -hmm. this is energy, and P is momentum. Like range of areas of energy and areas wait, of wait, momentum. Wait, 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 wait. Should it? It looks like Gaussian, right? Mm -hmm. And it should uh, be E grid minus uh, value. Should it be like Gaussian centered at some uh, point? No. You I didn't check. Yeah. It should be some subtraction, same as uh, in what uh, David was presenting. So it, be, it should be two Gaussians. I? Huh? Yeah. So I means time steps or orbitals? Uh, um, like orbitals. orbitals. Or energy or of orbitals. Okay. And for momentum, it should be just P, right? Or, yeah. Maybe there, there should be another uh, part of the code later because it, it, it looks like it would create 
just um, spot at zero zero point for zero energy and zero momentum. Probably, movie, probably this one, uh, this script for living movies when momentum is concert. Okay, let's go further. Oh, okay. Okay, so here it is, uh, oh, it is okay. really fine. Yes. So it's, it's centered at... Uh, um, Okay, and what is the um, so the first two lines are Gaussians as function of energy and function of momentum, mm -hmm. and what is the fourth line? So this is for electron populations. I is orbitals and times ten. So it, it multiplies the. Um, the Gaussian centered at given energy and given momentum times uh, probability distribution that this uh, orbital with given energy and momentum is occupied at a given instant of time, right? Okay, yeah, this makes sense. Okay, what's the, uh, the next set of things are can, can you go back one slide? And w where this uh, s uh, slice uh, is plotted? Where does it? Where it is plotted? No, no, no. Maybe it's uh, five fifth, fifth from the bottom. Yeah, this line, quantum F. So it should, it, see, it, it puts uh, momentum range, energy range, and then slice. So um, it was the question of, and then first for the elephants, and then. Uh, this one for elephants, and this one. Oh, it's, it's, it um, there was a question from, of uh, Kevin about. What is waterfall canon? And we discussed it with also with uh, David that there is waterfall mesh, and alternative is this quantum F and quantum. Oh. So those are commands to visualize uh, matrices okay. with two independent indices, and third dimension is like height of the matrix. Right. And they just uh, visualize in different form. Okay. Then the here the most important is uh, frame equals get frame, right? Mm -hmm. So this one is for the axis. Okay. And once the um, microprobe, after running the microprobe successfully, one should have this movie. X-axis is energy, Y this is time and when the movie uh, hole and electron are traveling to the bandages and time is changing so, um, is there a way to make it re repeat in the cycle ways Let's try it together. So how well, can you interpret what what is going on? How do you just uh so electron and hole, uh, they are traveling from the excited state to the ground state. These are the energy levels here. 
These are the energy levels, it's line. This is balance point, conduction line. These are the key points. This is the electron density, this red thing here. Electrons are tensed here. So uh, both electron and hole uh, change momentum while in the yeah. relax. So if you start uh, with excitation uh, gamma gamma, right? Both uh, electron and hole have zero momentum at initial time. Here. And as time passes by, uh, momentum of uh, electron increases and then almost returns to the gamma and uh, for the hole uh, settles somewhere in the cup way to the exponent. Um, why the initial excitation is single spot and final state uh, has several spots? I think electron and power can travel to any of the key points. Huh? Any of the key points at the bandages? So it's a degenerate? Approximately the same energy? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the um, different value of momentum for uh, lowest excitation means it will be not very efficient in emitting. At, at the end of trajectory, mm -hmm. the momentum of electron and hole do not coincide. So it is the factor that slows down the uh, luminescence, would make the quantum uh, unit smaller. Right? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's it. That's enough. And other questions? Okay, if no, then thank you once again. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you much for enthusiastic con contributions. And uh, I think we are done for, for the day. Uh, Aaron, would you try to make a dry run of your Tavari talk by next Tuesday? Mm -hmm. And we'll check if there are um, uh, some uh, urgent things to, to present by others. Uh, you may present once on Tuesday, or maybe even twice on Tuesday and on Friday. And uh, this Friday, everyone goes to uh, celebrate Independence Day or be affected by other side uh, celebrating Independence Day. It's a location. So um, Tuesdays, uh, for about a month after next Tuesday, uh, I will not travel, but I will pop up through the screen, so we'll keep the meetings. And we'll do like, research updates and uh, progress on those papers. And we will also have some for the first week. For one week. For one week, uh, many thanks to all presenters. Have a nice uh, course of joy. And um, if you are in the middle of a project uh, and hesitating what to do, just apply the skills from uh, today's talks to, to your system. Right? So apply data, run uh, uh, dynamics with different initial conditions, and the, like, accumulate long PowerPoints, like this 100 slides of dynamic figures at different uh, instances, subsequent analysis. <laughs>